recently an article in the Wall Street Journal about employers not getting the right employees. In fact, about 52% cannot find matches to fill job openings. One of the reasons cited was that universities don't provide the right training. Well, at Manhattanville College and at the School of Graduate and Professional Studies, we are trying to do exactly that. We have new programs in leadership, master's degrees in HR, marketing communications management, finance, executive education, professional education, and centers of excellence in emerging fields, such as our Center for Managing Risk, which is believed to be the uh, first and only one of its kind here in the United States that approaches risk from a holistic perspective. And as we speak, we're working on our Center for Executive Leadership, Development and Advancement for Women. And we will continue to try to build centers of excellence in industry-specific disciplines that will serve the needs of the student populations and local citizens, be they undergraduates, graduates, postgraduates, executive education, professional certifications, or corporate training. We want you and the community in Westchester to think of us as your home to training and education, because we are committed to Westchester. Manhattanville College is a citizen of Westchester. There are some other colleges, but we consider them to be tourists. And we will continue with industry-driven curricula that address the needs of business and the state of unemployment. I am especially grateful to our roundtable participants, Marsha Gordon, President and CEO of Business Council of Westchester, whose help in putting this together is, has been immeasurable and is invaluable. Marsha, thank you so very much. Larry Gottlieb, who is the Director of Economic Development of Westchester County. When you think Westchester, you think of Larry. Fanny Alman Lanch, who is the President of the Westchester Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Natasha Caputo, Director of the Westchester County Tourism and Film. Marissa Brett, who is the Executive Director of Economic Development for the Westchester County Association that does so much for this county. Robert Weiss, who is the CEO of the RCW Group in Real Estate. Stuart Marwell, the CEO of Curtis Investments. And our very own Louis Gamadella from the New York State Small, Small Business Development Center. We're so proud to be affiliated with you and your organization that does so much. I think last year we gave out some of the region $17 million of loans to small businesses. Unfortunately, today, Max Cheung, the group executive of Product Platforms for MasterCard Worldwide, was unable to attend. We have several VIPs in the audience, and whom I'd like to make mention of being particularly helpful to us as well. John Dorf of Dorf and Nelson, Peter Herrero, Barry Mittelman, Bob Castelli, the New York State Assemblyman, Robert Amler <coughs> from the New York Medical College, April Dubois from MasterCard, um, a, a surprise guest called Christy Abreu, um, Naomi Adler, President and CEO of the United Way of Westchester, Peter Giannone, Vice President with, with uh, Wells Fargo Advisors, Wolfgang Werner, from, uh, who's the Vice President at Thornton Tomasetti, who's also familiar with the Dominican Republic, as you know, Stephen Mafitano from Morgan Stanley, Neil Alexander from the Urban Land Institute, Randy Guillen from Cronus Consulting and Training, the foremost provider of training and education in the Dominican Republic. My good friend Cesar Fernandez, as a cabinet minister in the former government of the uh, Dominican Republic, and Andres Maranzini, Deputy Chief of Staff. GPS looks forward to building relationships with the business community and, of course, with government officials as well. And to that end, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Stephen Papas, who is here today representing Congresswoman Anita Lowy, who unfortunately could not be here, also due to a last minute conflict. And I'd like you, Stephen, please, on behalf of the Office of the Congresswoman, to say a few words. Thank you so much.
as a chair of the U.S. economy in the last four decades, with more than one out of five Americans, their jobs being tied to international trade. It is now very clear that the economy of our trading partners directly impacts our economy. In order to spur economic growth and create jobs at home, our nation must remain competitive in an increasingly interconnected global economy and continue to build new markets for American goods and services. By working together and investing in the education of our workforce, the U.S. economy and its trading partners can both profit. Westchester is home to leading biotech companies, manufacturers, and a hub of universities, which are preparing today's students for tomorrow's economy. These students, such as those in the School of Graduate and Professional Studies here in Manhattanville, know that greater collaboration with foreign universities and economies will benefit the economy here and abroad. Our economy thrives when we learn from one another, work together, and build partnerships that transcend boundaries. Congressman Lowy congratulates Manhattanville College and the New York State Small Business Development Centers for their work they're doing here and looks forward to your future successes. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Stephen. I've been very honored to have known Mr. President for a number of years now. And I might be so bold as to say that I consider him to be a friend and somebody who is an avid bookworm. The reputation is he, that he reads uh, at least one book a day. I've heard as many as two. <laughs> somebody who is thoroughly conversant, and I can attest firsthand to this, on, on a, a host and variety of topics that you would actually be amazed if you were to engage in a conversation. I was privileged enough when I was building the Division of Programs of Business at NYU to have gotten to know him and to have hosted him at my offices there. I was privileged enough to have to put together an economic summit down in the Dominican Republic to be held for the President and the Cabinet and the industry leaders over there. I'm now very honoured and deeply touched that we are able to continue our relationship and to work here at Manhattanville to continue the work that has been done to date. <coughs> the President is very committed to education of everybody everywhere and has made great strides in the Dominican Republic to better the lives of people through education. That's not in any way to minimize his economic success with the country. At a time when uh, we, uh, and I say we in the United States, and we in Europe have been experiencing minimal to negligible to negative growth in GDP. I believe that the Dominican Republic during this period of recessionary times has managed to average somewhere in the region of about 5% GDP. And I'm going to introduce him with the following quote that a, an alumnus of Manhattanville College sent me by an email a couple of days ago. President Fernandez has been the greatest leader in the Dominican Republic for the past 20 years. And as a native from the Dominican Republic myself, I'm very proud to see him coming to my alma mater and therefore continue to solidify our global relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President. Thank you so much for being David Sell for such a warm and generous introduction. I can actually say that, uh, in effect, we have a uh, long-standing friendship. And uh, I must say at the outset, an anecdote that took place during the 2004 elections in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Dr. Davidson, here in New York, was driving his car. He stopped at a light, a red light. There was a Dominican fellow driving next to him. I had a, uh, a bumper sticker with uh, my opponent's uh, dad. <laughs> And then he uh, pulled out his window and said, vote for you now. <laughs> I said this to a, uh, a Dominican that was living here in New York. So thank you so much for your early support in the 2004 election. Uh, and of course, as you know, when we talk about the Dominican Republic here in the United States, we are basically talking about a republic of baseball, a baseball land. Yeah. This is the Dominican Republic. And tonight we're having some difficulties because with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays in town facing the Yankees, we have Dominicans 
and both teams line up. So we don't know which way to to really support today, tonight's ball. Go Yankees. Go Yankees. <laughs> both, both <laughs> We're in New York. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, let me share with you uh, some news about the current economic and social political situation in Latin America in connection with the uh, uh, global economic crisis. I must start by saying that uh, in Latin America, we have been going through the best economic decade ever in our history. Since the beginning of the uh, 2002, 2003, and now, uh, we have had sustained economic growth in the region. In some areas, particularly in South America, in Argentina, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, never before that we had a decade of continued economic growth. And when we ask uh, what has really taken shape, uh, what has really occurred for this to happen, basically uh, it has to do with, uh, with China, what has been taking uh, place in, in South Pacific area. Because China has been the driving force in uh, importing, I would say, raw materials uh, from uh, all these countries. And so China has become the key driving force in pushing forward economic growth in the Latin American region. We usually divide uh, Latin America in two different geographical areas. Uh, one would be Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, uh, and South America. Because Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean are more integrated with the, the U.S. economy. While the others, South Americans, have been more linked to Europe at the beginning, and lately, as I said, more to Asia Pacific. Now, the importance the whole region has for the U.S. I think is immense. I think it's, it's very important. Sometimes we overlook the fact that Latin America is one of the U.S. major trade partners. Uh, there is more trade between the U.S. and Latin America than, for example, with China. There is more trade than, for example, with Europe. So Latin America is a very important region in terms of trade, in terms of economic relationship with the United States. And looking into the future will be even more because at this moment we have three countries from the region, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, that are part of the G20. And all of them in the next couple of years will have GDPs of over 2.5 trillion US dollars. So that's huge, that's important, and I think there is a need to develop some sort of strategy, global vision of connecting, integrating the economies of the U.S. with the rest of Latin America. Uh, what we're thinking now is about the sustainability of this economic growth. Uh, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank has called it the decade of Latin America. The question is, is it going to be sustainable for the next decade? And if it is, can we then call about the century of Latin America, which would be a century of progress, prosperity for the first time? Because 30 years ago, we didn't even have political stability in the region. So we have made a transition towards democratic governance, and now we're heading into sustained economic growth, sustainable development, and addressing all social issues like uh, poverty reduction, social inequality, higher education, quality education, and the fields of science, technology, and innovation. So the question is, how sustainable will the Latin American economy be uh, in the next 10 years? And of course, that will depend, first of all, about uh, the outcome of the global economic situation. And at this moment, we cannot be optimistic in the short term about what is going on within the global economic situation. Uh, Yesterday, we saw uh, in the headlines, Wall Street Journal first page, about the lowering of international trade that is already affecting the U.S. economy. The original projections in terms of economic growth have, have been dropped from over 2.0% this year to 1.5% and perhaps even less because of this uh, fall in terms of international trade. Exports have diminished, imports the same. The reason? The recession in Europe. Uh, since Europe is growing zero at this, at this moment, Chinese exports uh, to Europe has declined. U.S. exports to Europe has also declined. 
So for the first time, now Latin America is being also impacted by this uh, economic situation that is affecting international trade. So more than in 2008, when we had a global financial crisis that only affected certain areas of the world, Europe and the United States, not China, India, or Latin America, now for the first time we might see the situation where the global economic crisis will affect the whole world. China will drop its economic growth from 11% uh, to 7.5% 7, 7 in 2012 this year, which is the lowest economic growth in China since 1990. But India will also decrease its economic growth, and this will impact negatively uh, Latin America for the first time. So uh, we see at this moment, in the short term, a gloomy picture. Uh, in 2012, perhaps even 2013, we might see the situation. Now, moving forward, what we think is that uh, there is a debate which is at, at the heart of the uh, American presidential election about how to uh, solve the economic situation, how to overcome the global financial crisis. There are two lines of thought that we see very clearly, and depending uh, on which side you, uh, you take uh, uh, position, I think it would be easier or more difficult to overcome the current economic crisis. Uh, what we see is not two positions that are incompatible, but it's a question of sequencing and timing, the way we see it. We have to look at it in terms of short term or mid and long term. It uh, we will depend. In the short term, what we think we should try to do in the US, in Europe, and everywhere is to try to make the economy grow again and create job opportunities. We, we acknowledge, we cannot ignore the fact that there is a fiscal problem, uh, that there is a question of mounting debt, but addressing the fiscal problem, addressing the debt, should be a mid-long-term situation. We will not be able to solve uh, the debt problem in a year, in four years or five years. Uh, if you have uh, almost 100% GDP debt, uh, this is a long-term situation you know, in order to address and, and solve. So in the short term, we be trying to inject new resources into the economy to make it grow and bring back international trade again uh, uh, in, in its original footing. So the economy will generate a new dynamism uh, you will create jobs, you will create consumer confidence, and from there you can start picking up. In the mid long we, we believe that if the economy grows automatically, the debt in relationship to the GDP ratio will drop. Uh, there is an, a correlation between economic growth and the uh, debt situation. So if the economy grows automatically in relationship to the GDP, the uh, debt will, will drop. Uh, in terms of fiscal uh, responsibility, the same thing. I think you can not, which I think is a great mistake that has been uh, taken in Europe at this moment, if you have a recession and you implement austerity measures, uh, you're uh, aggravating the situation. You might even go from a recession into a depression. Uh, we see signs in the last uh, few weeks that even the European uh, Union is, is going in a new direction, which is through the European Central Bank also pumping in new financial resources into the system in order to make the economy grow. So there, there can be a very interesting side, an alignment between the US, especially through measures that are being implemented to the Federal Reserve with a quantitative easing, and now the European Central Bank with 500 billion euros that also will be going into the economy in Europe and that perhaps can be a good sign looking into 2013 to make the economy better. But I think it would be a tremendous mistake if within a recession or low uh, economic growth to uh, implement harsh austerity measures that can also create social problems and will create a problem of political instability. So this is, uh, I would say, an external factor that will affect the US, will affect Latin America uh, in the short term, depending on which measures are implemented. Now, for Latin America, looking more into a mid and, and, and long-term situation, I think our main challenge at this moment has to do with a strategy for competitiveness and innovation, which at the end has to do with education. Uh, our main concern in Latin America is that even though 
We have made tremendous progress in education because now there is more access to education. About 98, 99% of all children eligible uh, to enter the school system are doing so in Latin America at this moment. Uh, dropout rates has also lowered. But we still have a problem related to the quality of education, which should be in terms of curriculum, content, teacher training programs, the quality of our teachers. So addressing these issues will be key you know, in order to uh, improve the quality of education, but also better train our workforce for the future. One way of doing that, of course, will be establishing partnerships. And Manhattan Bill College can play a key role, not only for the Dominican Republic, uh, we have been working to NYU and, and Dean Davidson before, but Manhattan Field College can play an important role in teacher training programs, but also uh, in, in training future business leaders, civic leaders, creating an entrepreneurial spirit in Latin America. And, and that way, I think it can be of mutual benefit for America and for the Latin American youth. So the problem of education, I would say, is once again critical uh, in order to move forward. But the other has to do with uh, specifically higher education also. Because when we look at the rankings of universities, uh, of looking at world-class universities, the first ones to appear in Latin America are the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, number 200, and uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México from Mexico, which is also around the 200 uh, category. So, in comparative, in, in comparative perspective with other universities around the world, we're not at the same level. So we need to really develop a curriculum for science, technology, innovation, uh, training the workforce for the future. And if we're able to do that, then Latin America can guarantee sustainable economic growth. Latin America will be able to integrate within the world economy and will have an impact uh, in the future of the U.S. economy. Very briefly, just to say about the Dominican Republic, uh, in the last eight years during my two consecutive administrations, our GDP was 20 billion US dollars when I came into office in 2004. Eight years later, 2012, it is 58 billion dollars. So in eight years, we almost tripled our capacity to generate wealth. And if we look into the next decade, if we can sustain a 6% average a yearly growth, the Dominican Republic will have over 100 billion uh, a year uh, uh, GDP uh, uh, or uh, national wealth, which will make it a very dynamic and vibrant economy. And if you uh, consider the uh, accumulative process that all this generates, if we can sustain the 6% yearly economic growth in 20 years, the Dominican Republic can go beyond 200 billion US dollars. And having one-tenth of our population already in the United States, being bilingual, bicultural, traveling back and forth, I think it would also be of a tremendous force in terms of prosperity, progress, and social well-being. So I, I think that our fates are linked, uh, Latin America, the Dominican Republic, and the United States. Our main focus uh, in the short term should be how to overcome this very severe, deep economic crisis that has been there longer than we originally expected. I think it's, it's uh, urgent uh, to really tackle this problem, overcome that, and move forward into uh, our new challenges. So having said that, I'm open later on to exchange uh, some ideas and, and views about the global economic situation and its relation to the U.S. and Latin America. Thank you very much. Dr. Davidson, thanks very much, and I also want to welcome everybody here. It's not only a distinguished panel as well as President Fernandez, but a lot of brain power on that audience today, and uh, I'm a little bit awed. Um, I first want to ask President Fernandez exactly where he's hiding his teleprompter. Um, <laughs> anybody who speaks off the cuff like that, I uh, maybe if it doesn't work out down in uh, the Dominican Republic, we might have a position for you. <laughs> yeah, yes, we can do it on the weekends. Maybe I can fly to the Dominican Republic right there. Uh, I just want to start this off right away, and I'll ask first off our question. 
Dominican Republic, known as a tourism destination, but clearly other industries of equal importance there for their economy in some ways. Similar to the situations in Westchester County, always known for the Platinum Mile, 287 corridor, with so many uh, corporate headquarters there as well. But now, in Westchester, trying to change its identity to a bio hub, a biotech hub. And the same thing with President Fernandez, trying to, trying to change the image of the Dominican Republic so that the people at large, the world at large, knows their Dominican Republic has a lot more to offer than beautiful sandy beaches. So why don't we start with Larry Gottlieb and with President Fernandez on this idea of changing image. How do you do that? Sir, could you? Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Well, well, in our case, in the Dominican Republic, uh, we have been going through different stages. Uh, originally, we were a country known for it, its agricultural exports, sugar, coffee, tobacco, cacao, etc. And we made a transition into a more service-oriented economy with tourism, remittances from Dominicans living abroad, uh, trade, finance, etc. And also uh, through free trade zones, which at the beginning was more assembly, uh, uh, apparel, textiles, footwear, plastics, medical devices, etc. And I think we have made a successful story in terms of making this transition into a service-oriented economy. But the world is changing, and the Dominican Republic has to upgrade its productive capacity. And so it's, it's now I think the challenge is transforming from a labor-intensive economy, service-oriented but labor-intensive, <coughs> into a more capital-intensive, technologically-driven uh, economy. And this is where we stand today. Uh, but also, technologically-driven goes through stages. And I think at this moment, we will we'll be better off in terms of IT services. Uh, we're already having, <coughs> for example, call centers. Uh, some of the uh, Dominicans that have been trained in the US and are bilingual, they go back home and are actively integrated with uh, uh, call centers, but also back office services, <coughs> professional services. They also are doing this in the Dominican Republic. But I think our main challenge now, what we're trying to, to do, is to promote the software industry in the Spanish language. We see Spanish as, a, uh, as an economic asset. If we have 600 million plus uh, Spanish-speaking people in the, in the region, and over 50 million people of Spanish-speaking origin in the United States, I think there's an important market there. If we can manufacture uh, software products for education, for healthcare, uh, for transportation, uh, for professional services in Spanish, I think Spanish as a language becomes an economic asset that we can try to export economically for the Dominican Republic. And so that we have built what we call the Santo Domingo Cyber Park, which is a, which is a uh, technological park oriented towards uh, IT services. And so this is a major step forward. I would say then uh, our main challenge, as I said before, is training the workforce, improving the quality of education, and moving into uh, a next step, which would mean uh, increasing value added to our products and services, and being part of a global economic change, but more integrated within the US economy. 